Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, through Christ Jesus, our risen and reigning and victorious Lord. Amen. Well, I'm not sure how I can really follow that hymn that pretty much summed everything up. So, amen? We're done? Okay. Well, seriously, though, as we conclude our walk through the back end of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, as we talk about walking the Christian life, living out the Christian life, we have now come to the end and we hear Paul's instruction or his encouragement to stand. That's a little odd. We've had this momentum of walking, and so this is a bit of a challenge, not only for our continuing metaphor for walking, this metaphor of movement, but it also challenges our own sinful inclination to be the hero of our story. So I think this takes a little bit of shifting of sight of how we see things. That sounds kind of odd, but bear with me. So, what do I mean by that? Well, we're talking about spiritual warfare once again. And after the last few weeks of hearing instructions on how to live this life, the life this side of the resurrection, you might forget about how it all pointed to Christ. And you might just hold on to a little nugget of moralism as we move on. And so you might fall back into thinking that this life is really just about getting marriage right and using your time well and cleaning up your language. But the Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul, tells the Ephesians and us that there is something much bigger at stake. There are unseen forces all around us, and many are set against God and His reign and against His people. Now, not all are against God. I'm reminded of the prophet Elisha. If you want to go read uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, the king of Syria is out to get uh, Elisha, and he sends these troops. He finds out where he's staying, and there's this uh, city on a hill that's surrounded by thousands of of chariots and horses and troops, and Elisha's servant gets up and sees them, and he freaks out, and he goes and tells Elisha, he's like, don't worry, the ones that are with us are more than those with them. He's like, what are you talking about? So Elisha prays to the Lord to open this boy's eyes, and all of a sudden he sees thousands upon thousands of fiery chariots and horses. Whoa. See, the Lord is Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the heavenly armies. There's no need to fear the evil foe. And so, this reality is something that we need to shift our sight from. Because even when you don't see these forces with your physical eyes, yet by faith you still see these forces at work. And St. Peter echoes this reality when he writes in his letter, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. These great apostles, Peter and Paul, and the teachers of the faith, they acknowledge that the devil and his demons are eager to devour us. They want to lure us away from God. See, God doesn't let go of us, but if He lures us, we might walk away. And C.S. Lewis depicts this with brilliant imagination in the screw tape letters. Yeah, I know there's some fans out there. And in this book, C.S. Lewis depicts a series of letters written between a senior demon and his newly minted nephew, just come out of the academy. And he gives all sorts of advice on how to lure the patient, i.e. the victim, away from the Lord. But the most basic approach, the most basic tactic is simple distraction. Just have the person focus on the constant stream of the now. Never let him actually think about anything. Don't give him any time to think about the transcendent, the eternal 
Because if he has no time to think about what is truly good, true, and beautiful, if he has no time to pray, then he'll just sink into the jaws of the devil, often unaware of his dire situation. And so Paul, Peter, and Lewis, they all recognize that we are insufficient to resist the demonic forces ourselves. But they also confess that there is one who is sufficient. Indeed, they confess that there is one who not only resisted, but who has defeated those forces. This one, of course, is none other than the Lord Himself. Now, Peter implies this when he continues in the same text when he writes, resist firm in your faith, faith, of course, being reliant on the Lord, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Lewis's work is predicated, is built on this assumption that the devil cannot bear scorn, and simply by mocking him, he must flee away. Luther echoes this many times. But Paul makes this absolutely explicit. He writes, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. See, the focus of this very familiar text is not so much about the armor itself. Those are great pieces, the great gifts that God gives us. Yes, those are wonderful things. But think about David fighting Goliath. You remember how Saul tried to give David his armor. Oh, thanks for taking on this task. Go, feet, go fight that giant. But here, you'll need my armor. And you'd think that as the king, he'd have the absolute best armor in the land. So surely this would protect David from the mighty Goliath. Though you would think if it was really about the armor, why didn't Saul go out and fight him himself? But that's, that's another issue. Instead, David said, I can't use this. This hasn't been tested. Take it back. I'm already prepared. And why? Because it wasn't about the armor. David went out in faith. He trusted the Lord. He knew that the Lord would give victory, would give deliverance to his people. Because it wasn't about him or his armor or his sling or anything like that. It was about Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the champion over all spiritual forces. So Paul, in light of this, encourages you and me, all Christians, to stand firm in faith trusting the Lord, relying on His strength, not our own. But what does that look like? Well, it looks like looking to Christ. We don't focus on the armor. We don't focus on the weapon. We focus on the one who gives, the provider, the protector, the champion. We set our sights on Him. We shift our focus from ourself and from the demons and onto the Lord. And yet, the Lord has given us these good gifts, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace and faith, salvation, the Word of God, and prayer. So take up these good gifts, my friends. Take those gifts that have been given to you and put them to good use. Imagine this. Christ has come and he has rescued you from slavery out of the dominion of that tyrant, Satan. And he's brought you into his kingdom, made you one of his own, one of his citizens within his kingdom in his great fortress. Paul tells us this 
Earlier in the letter in Ephesians 2, he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Christ has done this. He's brought you here. And so we've been hearing these instructions the last few weeks of what life in this kingdom looks like, whether it's how we talk, how we use our time, what marriage should look like. But that's not all that goes on. Since this is a fortress, huge buttressed walls, and the devil is allowed to continue to attack for now, you are called forth to stand guard on top of that wall. And so, you might be tempted as you see the enemy below, you might be tempted to run out and fight, but Paul says, stand. And you might see the forces and you might be tempted to run and hide because you are insufficient, but Paul says, stand. He says, stand firm because this armor is tried and true. It will not fail you. Stand firm because the Lord himself is with you. Stand firm because Christ has conquered. He has won the war. You cannot lose. See, this imagery of this armor of the Lord isn't something that Paul's just making out of nowhere. The prophet Isaiah depicts this. For the Lord himself In Isaiah 59, the prophet sees this, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Sound familiar? Yeah? Pay attention to what's going on in this world. This is the status of our world. It's not new. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Jesus, the Son of God, God himself came down into our flesh, into our world to work out justice himself against the schemes of the devil and to rescue his people. Instead of metal, bronze, steel, Kevlar, whatever, He put on righteousness and salvation. And as Jesus hung on the cross, physically naked, you could not see his armor, yet he was still triumphing over the devil as a victor. And the people around him, they scoffed, they mocked, they could not see his victory because they did not have the eyes of faith But by faith, you and I, we do see his victory. That is why we have this sign, the cross, the sign of victory, the conqueror. By faith, you see that Christ has given you that victory, along with his armor and his sword. And by faith alone, you stand in him in his strength, in his might. And as you stand, as you stand guard on that wall of that mighty fortress, you wield the weapon of prayer, using the very word of God itself. This, my friends, is the practice of shifting your sight because prayer is an act of faith, turning away from yourself, from the evil forces, from other distractions of this world, and turning your sight to the one who listens to prayer, the one who is the victor, the one who is the champion, the one who saves. It's crying out from the ramparts, over here, 
And the Lord comes and saves you and rescues you from that temptation and that attack. So when the lust, let's say, begins to creep in, pray in confidence that Christ has already defeated it. When the laziness of the flesh starts to set in, look to Christ in prayer for His strength. When loving speech begins to turn into hatred, set your sights on Christ in prayer, who has spoken grace and truth. And pray for one another, not just for yourselves, but for all the saints, as Paul says. For your fellow soldiers next to you, to your left and to your right, on the other side across the world, I like to think of our shut-ins. If you're watching on YouTube, you can't make it here, but you're kind of like the artillery back in the fortress, lobbing those Holy Spirit bombs over the wall, supporting those who are on the front lines. Parents, teach your children to pray. Call on the Lord. Use the Lord's prayer day in and day out. God grant that we would all keep alert with perseverance in looking to Christ in prayer in the midst of this warfare that we're in, knowing that He has already overcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.